today on Wife of the Party. I have my friend Ruth back because September is Suicide Prevention Month. We did a podcast last September with her friend Anne-Marie about suicide prevention and resources. And this year for Suicide Prevention Month, uh, Ruth brought her friend Kelly, who produces an evening of plays at the Stella Adler Theater here in Los Angeles. This year, the plays are running from September 10th to the 19th, again at the Stella Adler Theater. Um, If you'd like information, uh, her website is alightindarkplaces.org. And if you'd like tickets to the show, uh, the web, the link to that is alightanddarkplaces.eventbrite.com. This episode is dropping the day before her first uh, show. So again, Suicide Prevention Month. So the plays that Kelly produces have to do with suicide. And it's meant for survivors, obviously, to come and watch. Every Saturday night, there's a Q&A with Ruth. Uh, about suicide prevention. They offer tons of resources for people. And I think they really offer a service to our community here in LA uh, for people who have survived suicide to process that in a public slash private forum, because public being then you're uh, with a group of people who probably have had a similar experience to you. And at the same time, you can just sit quietly and watch other people's experiences in a short play form. Um, what an amazing manifestation of, of goodness out of tragedy. Uh, it's very brave to take something as tragic as losing a parent from suicide and trying to turn it into good for other people. So I really commend Kelly for doing that. I wish that this play were on YouTube, but unfortunately... It is an equity stage that is uh, regulated by equity, which is a union for stage performers. So she cannot release this on YouTube, unfortunately, but maybe someday. Uh, So if you're in L.A. and you have any interest, Stella Adler Theater, September 10th through 19th, and all the information is at alightanddarkplaces.org. I am so grateful that she came and talked to me today. I learned again more about depression and about suicide and about how people who have survived this um, have to process suicide and how they have to kind of take care of other people where their tragedy is concerned, which kind of breaks my heart. So I hope, uh, oh, also Ruth, being Ruth, has asked me to put the suicide hotline out, which is 1-800-273-8255, or you can text 741-741. Ruth is such a wonderful advocate and a great resource and also has turned tragedy into service by giving her uh, time and her wisdom and her self really to this cause. And this is the a light and dark places is one of the places, only one of the places that Ruth gives her time and expertise to help people who've also survived suicide. She lost her mother to suicide many years ago, but is still helping people. What a great example of good human beings. If we all could just turn tragedy into service, um, what a great place, a better place the world would be. So anyway, thank you for coming back. I hope that you can learn from this episode. And we did laugh some. I mean, suicide's not a laughable thing. But we did have a few fun moments, Uh, so it's not super, super duper heavy and dark, but it is a heavy subject, so can't avoid that part. So I hope you enjoy the episode. I hope you learn from the episode like I did, and uh, thank you for all your emails. Thank you for, for all your input and your suggestions for episode ideas. I love everything I hear. I read every single email. I just don't get to respond to all of them, so thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy my friend Ruth and her friend Kelly, who I think now is my friend, uh, talking about a light and dark places and suicide prevention. I'm a morning person. I, I'm not. I, I might like I take off as soon as I have a few sips. No, of I'm at my best between like six and 10 and people on sets hate me because I'm like, Hey, what are we all doing here? And I'm just no. like, oh. pass. <laughs> Give me an hour. Pass. I am a <laughs> night owl. And so is my dad. It's so funny. My dad was just here and uh, we were uh, just up till like one o'clock in the morning working. 
And then he could sleep all day. And I'm like, so odd. Cause you know, most older people are like 5 a.m. I gotta mm-hmm. get my coffee. <laughs> He's not at all. It was kind of nice. And I was like, good. Well then I'm not, I'm not an anomaly that hates to wake up early. My boyfriend's parents are like, they'll call us sometimes around 11 here and they live in Florida or later even. And they call cause they know Devin stays up late, but they're in their eighties. Like I when it, I was like, what is this? He's like, they they're up until three or four. Oh, eleven at what, night. Oh yeah, like oh, this is what, Oh sorry, <laughs> excuse me, eleven at night. But it's like two a.m. Yeah. in Florida. That is weird. They're just awake. They, they have nothing to, to do to the next day. I mean, their their schedule is their own. There's yeah. no work. There's do no whatever kids. they want. Yeah, Isla Kreischer, my daughter, um, until she was quite old, was up by five thirty every day, and I kept going. Oh my God, when is this going to end? <laughs> like a mama, mama's doesn't have this clock. This is not my clock. She has not her clock anymore. Thank God. But I remember for years, she was probably five before mm-hmm. she started sleeping to like six, six thirty. It's amazing. The difference between five thirty and six. Yeah. Like, it's enormous. <laughs> enormous. It's a game changer. But see, I was a six o'clock baby. There was when I was a baby baby, there was a blackout in New York City where we lived. And apparently that morning I woke up at six and the rest of my childhood. But my parents, I'd go like stare one of them awake and they'd come <laughs> pour me a glass of orange juice. And then I'd go back in my room and play by myself till everybody else was up. How funny. Oh, that's so you've great. always been. I've always been shoved aside. Yeah. I'm more, <laughs> the moral of that story, I've always been shoved aside. Wow. Here's your OJ. Good luck. <laughs> Don't juggle knives while we're sleeping. That's funny. Now this one family we had we had sleepovers with. They'd put they had this closet. They put a rocking chair in there and a stack of books. They're like, do not wake the girls up. You go in there and you read. How funny! Wow. It's just your clock, right? Yeah. We all have our internal whatevers. That's yours. Still How crazy! Is. Yeah, that's cool though. So what are you working on, Kelly? I I have a, a suicide prevention play festival. That you do I'm per, uh, producing right now and acting it. And what is it called? It's called A Light and Dark Places, a collection of plays for hope. And it's our, I would say our flagship event throughout the year. We we do, well, pre-COVID, we do one-night events and smaller mm-hmm. things. But this is our, our main uh, suicide prevention month kind of um, event production that we we started five years ago and as a bit of an experiment. And now we're in our sixth year. That, oh, that's amazing. And it's what's really amazing is the way from when they started, how it's grown exponentially. Like, tell her, like they get submissions and it's just the numbers are crazy. So wait, before you tell me that, why did you start this? Uh, well, I well, I lost my dad to suicide mm-hmm. uh, almost. It'll be 10 years in October. Wow. I'm sorry. Thank you. That's really hard. It was hard. I was in college and it, it just kind of felt like we all had to grow up overnight. Mm. I have three sisters and we, I came out here to study acting. Mm-hmm. And as I was getting close to graduating, as I came out and it was just so much isolation and so much of still feeling like I didn't, I came out here because partly because I didn't want to be the girl whose dad killed himself. Mm-hmm. And back home, so many people knew. Where's home? Uh, Frisco, Texas. Oh, okay. Yes, it's just right outside Dallas. Right. And and so I came out here and I just, it, especially at a young age, like you get asked, hey, what do your parents do? And I very specifically maybe answer about my mom. Oh, but what about your dad? Mm-hmm. These kind of, and it's so innocent because it's, sure. you would assume. And, and then of course with acting, a lot of emotional stuff comes up. And if you're not dealing with it, you can't really be a, it, it's I, for me anyway, like you can't really be present in another, tell another person's story when you still have all these like things you're pushing down and shoving. And, and so when I got through towards the end of the program I was in, I, I decided I wanted to, I wanted to just find a way to uh, use theater to get people to talk about it because the more I was, you know, listening and and re- researching a bit, like so many people know someone mm-hmm. or they struggle with depression or anxiety or they know someone who's bipolar or, or they there's just so many of these things going on and no one's really talking about it or they're not talking about it uh, not properly but uh, yeah. and it, 
Healthy. Healthy. Yeah. They're not talking about it in a healthy way. Mm-hmm. And so I I thought, well, let's I love theater, so let's try this. So I had never produced anything before. And I, I initially I thought I was gonna do a play that had already been written. And I got the idea from a, a friend who's now on the board of directors to uh, take in submissions and get a bunch of short plays. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how it's been going ever since. We have uh, writers submit and we find uh, five plays that will work together and give us a variety of perspectives. And that's an that's, awesome ringtone. I'm so sorry. That that's song. okay. I love it. What is it? A Little Respect by Erasure. That's right. <laughs> that's it's not, it's not a ringtone. It was a war. Oh, I love it. <laughs> that's Reminded awesome. You to be here. <laughs> reminding you, up. reminding oh, you to start talking now. Yeah. If you haven't started talking by now, start God. now. God, I'm so sorry. That's okay. Oh, all right. Back to suicide. Back to suicide. Back to suicide. <laughs> there we are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I did this. We, we take in submissions now, and so what the shows turn into is five plays that work together. They're about ten to twenty minute plays each, and They all give a different perspective, a different uh, scenario or point of view or style of of writing. And with the idea that someone will see something they connect to and also to show like suicide doesn't discriminate. It affects everyone Mm -hmm. in mental health. It affects everyone from all ages, races, cultures, locations like and so and so every year is different. And it's and it's. it's been really great. And when the and the main goals are to bring some hope and community and understanding and resources. So we're very careful about safe messaging and it, it, the balance of not wanting it to be a PSA it, mm-hmm. and not wanting to be just um, gratuitous. It, it can be kind of a hard balance. Mm-hmm. Sometimes uh, I think sometimes we lean towards closer to the PSA side than but the writing isn't a PSA. Right. It's just because uh, we want to be really careful, especially it's not regular. Uh, we don't have just theater go- goers mm-hmm. coming to attend. Like we have, we have real uh, loss survivors and people have experienced um, lived experience. So, so we want to be really mindful of that. But that's the show. That's <laughs> wonderful. You know, it's 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 so great when you have. You can't change the tragedy. There's nothing you can do to change it. But to use it to help other people is, I think, the best thing anybody could do in any tragedy. But suicide in particular, uh, we've had uh, some close friends who have committed suicide. And you just are left with a completely different feeling than any other experience I've ever had. Um, And people don't talk about it and because you don't know what to say. And you don't know how to be sometimes and to have a forum where you can just sit and watch and you don't maybe even have to talk about it It, to watch and experience someone else's experience can make you feel not alone. Yeah. And and that that's why I why I I believe in, in doing or the theater show is because what's beautiful about theater is it's communal. Right. And so you're you're having an exchange of energy mm-hmm. and and you can be there and be alone in the dark and also not be alone and get to maybe look at some of these things together, knowing that the person next to you or someone, a, you know, a few rows down might be having a similar experience. Right. So like you were saying, you're not alone. Right. And yet it can still be a bit private if you if you want it to be. Right. That's so cool. How brave of you to do that. <laughs> do you feel like you had to be brave to do that? Um, that's a great question. That's a hard one for me. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, probably. Yeah. It, it was huge to start doing it. It was very scary. I I was lucky. I had, um, some really good friends. My friend Salim was really there for me and, and helped me with the producing side in the beginning. And, and it was because what I had to do was become comfortable at least in this context Mm -hmm. saying, yeah, my dad died. This is why I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. And, and prior to that, I hadn't been comfortable. I had been really ashamed or scared Mm -hmm. because to say it out loud makes it real. And every time you say it, it's more real. Mm -hmm. And, and so why were you ashamed? 
Uh, because not of him, but like a feeling abandoned, like uh, this, like he left, like he didn't want to stay for us. And, mm-hmm. and I know now that's not it's what like you didn't love me enough to stay. And, yeah. and that caused you to feel shame. Like, like you weren't good enough. Yeah, a little. Yeah. Yeah. We're just embarrassed to tell people not embarrassed. Be- embarrassed isn't the right word. It's, um, because when you say the word suicide, people go, oh, uh-huh. oh, oh. And, and and I would get a couple, what uh-huh. on <laughs> earth is happening? I'm so- I'll tell you what's happening. Your daddy's saying, what are you talking about right now? Yeah. Stop know. talking about me. I, Maybe um, he's sending you a really fun, funky song that we're dancing to saying, bring it on, girlfriend. I have to say, I have to say, I keep seeing. Wait, don't talk till you get on the mic. <laughs> I can't hear you. Especially if it's I keep good. I keep seeing um he was born June 2nd, 1957 and I keep seeing twos and uh I keep seeing five sevens <laughs> the last couple of weeks. It's kind of fun. Uh, I don't think that's a mistake. No, and and I've been seeing a couple 6257s and and I just keep picking up the phone at 57 on not on purpose. It's mm. been kind of fun. That's not a mistake. I don't think no. that's a mistake. I don't either. So mm. it feels good. But ashamed. Yes. Yeah, so the, it's the reaction that people give and it, it makes it a big, it already hurts so bad. Mm-hmm. It, it's, and it's so, there's already so much trauma. And then when you want to tell someone or it comes up, the, the, the reactions, yeah, they, they, for me, they're, it can be huge or it's, oh, oh. And, and that, that's really hurtful. Mm. Uh, they don't want to talk about it. They just, you know, shake their head or get very, you see someone get very uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and, or they ask, well, they start asking questions and, and that's normal. It's human to want a story, Mm -hmm. but if it's not your story, it's really not appropriate. I don't think. Well, there's also no easy answers. So, that too. You yeah. know, if they say why, then you have to go into the whole thing. It's not just one thing. It's it's a layer of different things that were happening in his life and blah, blah, blah. And it, right. just, it either takes over the conversation and that's all you're going to end up talking about. Or like you said, it gets cut off and then it's just awkward because you yeah. know why it was cut off. Well, it seems or to it, me like they're forcing you to take care of them. Right. And, and it, sat- it satisfies their curiosity. And what happens is you get left, you know, the conversation ends for them. But mm-hmm. it reopens things for you. Totally. And if, if you're not, if you don't want to do that. Right. You're not left with a choice. Right. Because they've imposed their need on you. And now you're left taking care of them when you really should just be taking care of yourself. Yeah. And especially in the earlier years yeah. um, when it's still so raw. I, I mean, I still think it's raw. Like I probably still have once a week little flurries. Um, of emotion around my dad and uh, but it doesn't feel as unmanageable mm-hmm. but especially even up to a couple years ago it was just still very it's just such a thing to navigate and like mm-hmm. how do you navigate it when when you're so young mm-hmm. and and um, yeah how old were you I know you're in college but I was 22 22 that's really young yeah that's and- super young and not realizing that. And then I remember it was a couple of years ago, one of my sisters and I were kind of in a tiff and I had said to my boyfriend, she's just, she's, she's just 25. And then I, I kind of hit me for the first time. Like <gasps> when I was 22, I was a baby mm-hmm. and, and I hadn't had that cause I'm the oldest. So oh, okay. I had to, for me, I just, I had to go into like, okay, I'm, and my mom is in and out of the picture. So she's not, um, she wasn't really capable of, of helping us. Mm -hmm. And, and so it was, yeah, it's very, it was very young. Um, and the youngest was 12. So, cause we're 10 years, there's uh, four of us. That's really hard. It's hard to lose a a parent at 12. You, you know, you, there's so much you haven't even started developing at 12. I mean, at least at 22, you've, you've gotten to a certain place. But at 12, yeah. it's, I would imagine that would be very difficult. I know my dad's wife, uh, her husband was murdered. Um, and uh, they had three kids. And the youngest was a girl who I think was 12 or 13. And man, I watched because they started dating about a year or so after he had been murdered. And 
I just watched her process things thinking this is actually about her dad being dead. Like this is about her dad being, she's been robbed. Yeah. Like right. robbed entirely of this development that she deserved. And it was really, you know, my dad's a lovely human being, but that's not her dad. Right. You know, he's a great stepdad. They're super close. I love that they're so close, but he couldn't have possibly filled those shoes. There's no way. Well, because it's also involved with trauma. I mean, it's, it's not exactly. it's not an explainable death. It's a he was taken. He was taken. And yeah. suicide similar. Right. That that parent was just ripped from you unexpectedly. Right. Even if the parent I would imagine was suffering outwardly, was depressed, obviously. It's still, you, I think sometimes that's just so unexpected, right. that especially for a child. Yeah, I mean, you, you go to bed one night. I went to bed and I woke up the next day and not, it was like the ground opened up. And, mm-hmm. not, and we, you know, me and my sisters have been slowly pulling ourselves out of the, the hole right. ever since with, you know, met with judgment in some cases from people giving us timelines and and timelines for what for grief and recovering and oh people, that's a bunch of it's bullshit been a month. why aren't you that's yeah, a bunch of bullshit right two, there it's been two years why are you oh. still upset yeah, why well, are you talking about well that? you're in your 40s and it wasn't your dad so maybe <laughs> like you don't get to <laughs> that's a bunch of bullshit no yeah. one gets to tell you your timeline for your mental health and your healing yeah no one because let me tell you i didn't have suicide. my parents are both alive I have a really rough relationship with my mom. And sometimes when I start talking about some pieces that were really rough, I am shaking on the inside. I'm 51. Like that stuff happened 40 years ago, 40 plus years ago. And I still shake on the inside. So, and nobody can tell me there's something wrong with that. Because you know what? I work out with a trainer who I love, Mikhail. (laughs) Um, And, um, I believe you store trauma in your body, right? So when I started working with this trainer about a year and a half ago, maybe, um, trauma started showing up in my body, right? And trauma showed up a couple weeks ago in a place I'd forgotten about. And we've been really, uh, once trauma shows up, I just like pinpoint focus on it and go, I'm getting this out of my body. I'm just getting it out. I don't want it. So we started focusing on this part of my body. And yesterday he said to me, you know what you are? You're a cleaner. Some people clean house. When they find that trauma, they clean it out. And some people don't. And some people are cleaners years later, where all of a sudden they go, I'm cleaning this shit out. <laughs> and I'm like, that's a really interesting perspective about taking care of your, your trauma. Like, because it is a soiled part of your fiber, right? This trauma that I'm working on now is in my shoulder. And so, I feel like that's like, not dirty, but like dark, you know, Mm -hmm. and it needs to be kind of rinsed out and cleaned out. And how do you do that? How do you do that? It's different for every person and for every trauma. But it's let's see, you have to recognize that it's trauma because I think for my 30 years of not talking about my mom's suicide, I didn't know that. Like I had intellectualized it probably like within a year down the road. Say, okay, she was, you know, this was going on, this was going on. I kind of get it. So once I intellectualized it, I was like, this can no longer affect me. Now it's huh. it's up to me. Right. So every single thing in my life that went wrong, I blame myself for, mm-hmm. you know, so it's like mm-hmm. without and not using it as an excuse. But later I learned, no, I act certain ways because I lost my mom at that age right. or the way I did or whatever, right. you know. And but I wanted to say something interesting because a lot of people are like when they hear suicide, they're like, oh, my God, that's the worst, like whatever. And in some ways it is, it's because it adds this whole other layer of stuff you have to get through. Mm. But the, and, but I've, I've always said, like, I think it's probably the same for murder and stuff, but a friend of mine, um, her brother died by suicide and she had to go to the morgue and, and um, identify him. And she said there was another family there and it was the family of a murder victim. And she was jealous of them. Like, that's how much it hurt her that her brother did this to himself, that she'd wished like, at least with the pain of murder, there's blame to go around. There's, you know, whatever. But she's like, all I got was he did it, you know? And, wow. And, and that, that like complicated, uh, m- like complex emotion of like, you were angry at them for it, but you feel so bad for right. them that they did, that they thought they had to right. in that moment. That, right. That they were in that much pain. And, and then where do you, you're saying, where do you put that? Mm-hmm. Because you're, it's all in the person. 
um, or it starts coming at yourself. Mm-hmm. Right. Or, or it's someone else. Or it's it's someone. your fault. You did this to him and that's why he did that. Right. And then mm-hmm. that's an oversimplification. Yes. And then when people try to tell me that, you know, people try to theorize or go, oh, well, it's because of this or that. To me, it, it's it's making him too small. It's saying you're saying this thing is mm-hmm. why he did that. Mm-hmm. No, because it has to be so many things mm-hmm. or else you're making him to be this not whole human being. You're right. t- it's like I feel like they're taking agency from him in a yeah, way. Because too mm-hmm. many people have a lot of problems and don't yeah. kill themselves. So right. by saying somebody did it because they were getting divorced or because they were diagnosed with some disease, that's like, really, that's all it took. It's too simple. Yeah. That's, right. I see what you mean. Way. That's a really great, uh, great thing to put out in the world, because I think people I think it's human nature to want an answer. Absolutely. It happened because of he went bankrupt. Right. Oh, got I mean, it. Well, I went bankrupt. Didn't happen to me. Thank God. But that's not really how life works ever. Right. And it may be the bankruptcy that pushes them over the edge. Totally. That's the final straw. But what else had to be going on? Because right. bank, plenty of people go bankrupt and yeah. plenty of people don't kill themselves. Right. right. It's like, far more complicated. What we don't know is there's childhood trauma mm-hmm. and a, a mental health condition mm-hmm. and, and you know, all these compounding other, yeah, factors. Other home factors or whatever. Yeah. There can be so many. <laughs> there can be. It can be a pile on. <laughs> right. Tell you. Well, you know, it would you would think it that would be obvious that it wouldn't be just one thing. I mean, to me, that's that's ob- to me, that's obvious. But I've spent my whole adult life trying to fix my own mental health. So I am someone who's definitely <laughs> looked into that arena. Right. So but most people right. don't because they don't want to. There's taboo. They're not interested. They don't even know they need it. They have nothing's wrong with them. Why would they do that? And, and you know, the the, the thing about humans is that we are super complex yeah. and mental health in and of itself. I don't even think we know 10 percent of what we're what's really going on in our just our chemical makeup mm. and the electricity in your brain, you know. Oh, yeah. And how it interacts with what you eat, even, right. you know, even that. So. Right. And I think people just sometimes too just want a simple answer. It's mm-hmm. easier for them to be able to put it in oh, a yeah. bow. They mm-hmm. don't have to look at. It, like things they missed or yeah and and or, the fear it can happen to them like oh yeah. my god what if you know what if i go bankrupt does that mean i'm gonna right. kill myself you know because it's scary and that's i think mostly why people don't even like talking about suicide it's too scary to so think about so how should your perspective about suicide change so if this is the general public's let's we're obviously making a huge sweeping generalization right the people need it to be one thing and or Obvious, huge sweeping generalization. How should your perspective change about suicide? How should the reaction change? What should be different instead of why or um, what's the story? What what would you rather have someone react with? I think for me, it's just understanding that that person was in an incredible amount of pain, whether it was mental pain, physical or combined, and that not to judge like, oh, this bad thing happened, so they just quit. You know, definitely it's not a quitting mm-hmm. thing. Like in some respects, I think it's incredibly brave because I know I don't I wouldn't have the guts like you're going to die. You're killing yourself like that. We are we're um, wired to want to live. It's mm-hmm. our basic instinct. So, you know, I think there's some amount of bravery to actually be able to go through with it. I mean, but it's also desperation. And I think that's what people really need to understand that it is a mix of things. It's never one thing and that these people deserve compassion Mm -hmm. and help and not, not this judgment or, or stigma of being weak and wrong or whatever. It's just people in incredible pain that can't find any other way out. So if you started with compassion for the person who died, I I would hope it would lead to compassion for the people who are struggling. Mm -hmm. And instead of having this attitude of, oh, they're lazy or, oh, they're crying Wait, out for attention. Who's lazy? The depressed people who can't get off the couch. Like instead of understanding oh, there's a yeah. real, there's a real, uh, a, a real physical condition mm-hmm. happening because it it is, it's, it's just like any other body issue, any other physical, you know, medical condition. And, and if we had more understanding and compassion for that, and um, I think that would, that would hopefully bleed. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, like seeing it like cancer, like, mm-hmm. you know, like depression's like cancer of your brain in a way that, mm-hmm. you know, it eats away all your good thoughts. Mm-hmm. And so you end up lying there. So, yeah. you know, but people are like, well, they're lazy. Well, they're sick. Well, you I, know. you know, I have to tell you, that was my perspective for a long time. I mean, especially being from the South. Oh, yeah. You don't we, have a choice. We, we tie it up and we, keep, I know yeah. Texas is slightly different, but it's, I'm <laughs> yeah. sure it's still <laughs> pretty we, similar. We, it, we got to, everything's great and you just got to pick it up and keep going. And we don't talk about that. And like, we yeah. just kind of, here's a glass of wine. It's fine. <laughs> that are, you know, my family, well, not my family, but the culture I grew up in was like, I don't have time to be depressed. Right. I got to put food on the table. Right. If right. I miss a day of work, my family doesn't eat. So I don't have the luxury of not taking a shower and walking. That was actually my perspective completely mm-hmm. until very recently. And I had a, did a podcast with a therapist and someone who was diagnosed as depressed because I wanted to change my bias. I had a sincere bias against depression. I didn't really completely understand the like, spectrum of depression because you hear depression and that means like 8,000 things. It means I'm sad today because I didn't see my friend at lunch, Mm -hmm. you know? And it also means something chemical is going on in your body that you're not in control of and you have no choice from. And what caused that chemical reaction could be situational. It could be trauma-based. It could be just your physical makeup. I didn't really understand all that. And when the therapist started explaining, as as enlightened right. as I am as a human being, I was still a meathead in that department. Right. And I think if people could look at themselves and go, I don't know everything. I can't possibly know everything. I live to be the best person I can be. And I would still look at depressed people and go, wish I could do that. I can't do that. Right. Until I talked to the therapist on my podcast and I went, I am a freaking asshole, total asshole. Admittedly, I am a complete asshole because I did not understand and I had no desire to understand. But also, but look at what what that did to you, not talking about it, not allowing yourself to feel those emotions, put yourself in the reason that you're going through all this stuff now and having, you know, trauma show up in your body and stuff because you also just pushed it away because you weren't allowed to talk about it. Right. So I'm saying any kind of trauma is not just suicide. Totally. It, it, It totally affects us and it's, But yeah, I just I wish that we could think of depression sometimes not not like clinical, but as like, you know, you have a cold and you need a couple days off. Yeah, sometimes I sometimes I I know because I can feel it coming. I I start to feel unsettled and I say, okay, here here we go. I'm going to have a bout of depression. And I have a couple of days where it's really hard to motivate. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the best thing to do for myself is to say, okay, you can do you're going to set an alarm for five minutes. You're going to try to get a couple things done. If after five minutes you don't you don't fill up to it, you can lay down today. It's okay, right? I, I, and and it, it really feels like a cold in a way okay. sometimes. And and but I'm acknowledging it. I'm saying okay, we can live here for for a day, mm-hmm. or not a you know a day or two, and kind of ease that back out of it. And I don't know, but it I find that to be helpful. And I mean, yet I would lie. I have a cold. I can't do this now because mm-hmm. I'm I'm depressed. I can't do this today. Doesn't. Right. Compute, right. Does, it doesn't. Yeah, because people are yeah. like, well, I'm depressed too and I'm here, you yeah. know. Right, right. But I physically but can't do it today. I just, like, right. yeah. I just have sort of the idea because I, I give presentations sometimes. That's mm-hmm. sort of how we got together is when I volunteer for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, I give presentations about sort of the basics of suicide and how to approach somebody and all that. And so when she starts her plays, um, I talk to the directors and then I talk to the cast. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, about safe messaging and all that. And just in the last presentations I did, it was after my cousins came to visit me for a week here. And um, there's there's two daughters and the 20 year old was just diagnosed with the autoimmune disease in her back. So it's Mm. something that like starts fusing your spine and your rib cage and it's awful. And she's been in in pain for like five years and they finally got it diagnosed. And like we went to Universal Studios and we had to get her a wheelchair and she still only wanted to stay like two hours because she was just, she can't stand, she can't sit, you know, it's all just painful. The other daughter has been having serious anxiety issues since um, she's in high school and since COVID started and she's kind of been trapped in the house with her dad. 
And, you know, she's really struggling and they're struggling to figure out how to help her and get her to want to go to therapy and things like that. And I said, you know, maybe the best thing you can do is compare it to what's going on with the other one. Like tell, you know, show her you, we went through hell and high water to find the right doctor. Five years now we have a diagnosis. We're getting her treatment. Hopefully it'll help. But we also have to make accommodations for her because she's in pain. She's in physical pain. She cannot do it. Mm-hmm. You're going through the same thing, only it's in your brain. Because I think, I have a feeling she's looking at it like it's my fault. There's something wrong with me. Aww. And it's not that there's something wrong with you. There's something happening to you that's causing you pain. Right. It's not you doing it. There's something happening in your body that's causing you pain. And just like for your sister who's in physical pain, we want to get, we want to find the right doctor, find you the right help. Because there's not one easy answer for everybody that's got depression or anxiety, but I don't know. I don't know if they talk talk to her about it because I was sort of, you know, I'm like, I just have to say this, and right. you guys do what you need to do. But um, you know, it it really hit me in the face with that. That when we talk about looking at it as a health condition, that is really how you have to approach it because we will do anything for anybody that's in physical pain. You're right. That's absolutely right. What great advice you gave them. I hope they took it yeah. because um, I know I have a friend who has a young uh, daughter who is in, is she in ninth grade, eighth grade, ninth grade? And they've been struggling with depression, not depression, I'm sorry, with anxiety with her for a while. And she's so resistant to therapy. The The young girl is like, yeah. nope, 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 nope. There's such, that's what kills me is culturally, right. we have such a stigma right. on mental health and on getting help for mental health. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I feel the same way you do. If you had cancer, you would seek to the ends of the earth right. to yeah. get it taken care of. But we don't do that. And, you know, the depression. And I grew up super blue collar, a really small town. And as I, countering what we just said, a counter perspective is some people don't have time to say, I feel depression coming on. Right. I got to take a couple right. days off work. I, it's just like a cold. They still go to work when they have a cold because they can't afford it. Right. So how do they, how do people, like everyone I grew up with, like my entire, you know, childhood, my dad would never take off work. He'd have to be like vomiting blood mm-hmm. <laughs> to take off work. So much less for, because he couldn't afford it. Right. So it's a luxury that we can even propose that for some people in this country. And I think that's a shame. Yeah, that's shameful. And I I think that's where we get to where we start talking about, you know, changing the culture. And hopefully that changes the the work environments where Mm -hmm. the employers start realizing I'm actually going to have better I, I will actually get more out of my employees if I can understand <laughs> right. that, like, this is a real thing. Yes. And I can give them, pay, uh, you know, they can have paid time off when they need, uh, you know, or 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 that maybe therapy is covered better on, on um, totally. health insurance. Yeah. And, you know, I think for all the horrible things from the pandemic, that is the one thing coming out of it is mental health is being spoken about more. Yeah. And, you know, it's becoming less of a stigma. I think there'll always be some kind of stigma because it's invisible. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, it's like when you have a headache and you want to leave work, they're Mm -hmm. like, really, you can't stay two more hours, you know? So unless you look pale and like you're about to puke, people don't always believe it's serious, you know? So it's it's, not measurable. Right. Right. It's not measurable. And it's different for everybody. So there's no like course that's going to go through. Like, you know, I I was actually um, trying to help a friend through cancer um, and I was, it was causing me great anxiety and I kind of have a, an anxiety attack in front of her. And I said to her, cause she's, you know, she, she was trying to do the comparison thing. I'm like, yeah, except you're going through treatment and ostensibly going to get better. I'm like, I'm stuck with this for the rest of my life. Right. Like I may go through hills and valleys, right. but you're seeing me at my worst. And this isn't like the worst I've ever been. Right. So, you know, it's just, it's a different kind of disease that uh-huh. you can't just treat and make it go away. It's very true. It's something you have to manage. I live with three people who have anxiety, like real, not regular anxiety. <laughs> Everybody has anxiety. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I'm on medication for anxiety, but I mean. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my oldest daughter had an anxiety attack on Saturday. Mm. I mean, like the kind where I can almost see her shirt moving. Her heart's beating so oh. fast. And she's like, just got to like, just got to like hold on to the fastest, scariest roller coaster ever. 
until her body just calms down. And she was just working out. I mean, like nothing was happening. Nothing to my knowledge is going on in her life that would trigger this. Mm -hmm. She is, I think every panic attack Georgia has ever had has been completely out of the blue. So to me, I think this is something chemical in her body. So she's probably got a surge of hormones because she's 17 and her anxiety stuff went, yeah, panicking, ready, let's go. And, but the other daughter is all situational. There's definitely something in her closet and she's 15. (laughs) Something's definitely under her bed. Someone's for sure breaking in the house and killing everybody for sure. Like hers is all... Like thought. Projection. Yes. It's all from her way of thinking. Whereas I don't see that with Georgia, but they're the same condition. You know what I mean? It's it, yeah. Or it may anxiety. be Isla's expressive and Georgia's not about what's going I've on. I've asked Georgia and literally Georgia from the look on her face is like, this is a total head scratcher. Nothing's going on. But I'm sure... Things may be going on that she's not managing as well as she right, thinks right. she is. Right. But she thinks she is. So right. it, it's just such a different, it's so interesting. My kids are so different. But for them, they, they have these really genetically flawed mouths. <laughs> and they both have this really bizarre anxiety things. And they're completely different from each other and the same condition. Like mm-hmm. their mouth diagnosis is the same diagnosis. And the conditions... And the procedures they've needed have been completely different from each other. And I feel like the anxiety is the same. So when Georgia first started having anxiety attacks, I had anxiety as a child, not an anxiety disorder. I am dead inside. I don't have any of that shit. And I'm so (laughs) grateful. But I had a lot of anxiety from trauma when I was a kid. And so I had these ways of getting myself to sleep because my anxiety showed up when it was time to go to sleep. Like Isla's. That's where Georgia showed up in the beginning was with sleep. So it's like, here's what you do. Deep breath in, deep breath out, deep breath in, focus on that. Start counting up to 100 and then back down and then up to 100 and just focus. Make yourself like laser focus on the number of one, two, three, four. And then that'll get your mind off what's causing you this anxiety. And Georgia kept going, it's not working. And I'm like, you're not doing it right. It's not working. Well, then try it again. Well, then visualize a fairy and really do her whole hair, makeup, outfit, really get into the details and that'll get your brain off not working. And I parented it horribly because I would go, then you're just not doing it. Then why are you being defiant? Why aren't you trying? And then at a certain point I went, hold on, maybe I don't know what I'm doing. Let's go get a therapist Mm -hmm. and see what she says. And the therapist goes, yeah, you're wrong, Leanne. (laughs) That was all wrong. (laughs) That is not how her brain works. This is what she needs to do for her brain. And I went, oh, okay. I apologize to Georgia for still apologize to her because I screwed that up so bad. I caused her a year of struggling, trying to force her to do what worked for me. And it didn't work for her at all. And then the doctor went, yeah, that would never work for her. That that was, that was just makes things worse. She needs this other set of tools that you don't even know exist because you've never had to use right. them. Then Isla starts having this anxiety. And I go, here's what you do. You count up and you count down. And, and she's not working. So I go, okay, we're going to go see Dr. too. Dr. goes, this brain works like yours. She's just not able to keep it focused. But this is every tool you're giving her is exactly what this brain needs. Mm -hmm. And I went, are you freaking kidding me? And we don't think we need therapists. Really? Yeah. How could I have known that? I mean, I, it worked for me. Why wouldn't it work for you? Right. What an ignorant, ignorant and closed minded point of view I had. Well, see, one of my big regrets is when we moved to my family moved to Texas from New York when I was 11 going on 12 and I was going into middle school, which Ugh. but the second year of middle Ugh. school because in New York, bad timing. elementary yeah. school went to sixth grade. <laughs> so, mean. so it was, you know, it was very traumatic all around. Yeah. And oh, yeah. culture shock completely. Um, But anyway, I became very angry and acting out and like not taking showers and stuff like that. And um. I walked into for breakfast one morning to the kitchen and my parents were sitting there and they're like, you know, do you want to see, do you want to see somebody? And I went very defiantly like, no, I'm not crazy. 
you know, and I got angry and then I kind of snapped out of my bad behavior because I'm like, oh, I don't want him to force me to go. But, you know, looking back, I'm like, who the hell would let like a 12 year old decide this? Right. If you think I need a therapist, I need a therapist, right, especially because right. it wasn't a big thing back then. Right. You know, and so just I think about like, what if they'd forced me to go and, you know, how different my life could have I, been or, or the coping tools I could have I could have had before my mom killed herself. Right. Or, you right. know, learned to have. Right. That's an interesting I, I point. That. Yeah, I, I felt that a lot. I had a b- pretty bad eating disorder and they keep an eye on it, but or like tell me like, hey, you know, maybe this or that. But it was never what I needed was for my parents to say, hey, we're taking you somewhere and we're getting this figured out. Right. And they didn't they didn't parent. Right. Uh, I don't think maybe they knew they could because of yeah. their childhoods and, and stuff. But yeah, I, I think. Sometimes it would have been much more helpful than to be where I am now, still kind of navigating instead of, you know, really getting, especially back then. I was so, it was really rough. Was it? Yeah. I bet it was. Eating disorders is something I I think is also very complicated and a completely different podcast episode, but it's something I've always wanted to talk to someone about. I don't know if you'd be interested in coming back. You don't have to answer now and talking about that, but I've always been interested in that because that's clearly something I never had any problems with, but it is, I believe it comes from a a type of trauma or neglect also. And I, I I don't, I want to, I'd like to unpack that so that people who are listening can recognize it in maybe their child and say, Mm -hmm. "Uh Oh, let me get you help. Like you need right now. Cause the whole purpose, I don't know if you know much about my podcast, but my whole point of of starting my podcast was a couple of reasons. I wanted to have fun. I wanted to have conversations with people I care about and I want to learn something. And I hope in my learning something like about depression, then other people get to Mm -hmm. learn also. And you get to learn in a non-aggressive, non-confrontational way, Mm -hmm. right? So it's different when you sit here and we're having a very confrontational, you know, that confrontation doesn't mean negative, but we're having a conversation about things that are uncomfortable, which can be confrontational. And to just listen, to be a fly on a wall can help you say, oh, this area of my life is the same and now I understand it better. Mm -hmm. So if I learn, Mm -hmm. then anybody listening is learning. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a gift to me. I give that gift to me to feel like if I can help someone not have to figure this out all by themselves, because I had to figure everything out all by myself. And it's so lonely and difficult and, um, It's like tearing things apart sometimes to get to the bottom of an issue. And if I can help anybody not have to tear themselves apart just a little bit to get from A to leapfrog from A to B, that's such a gift to me because then I feel like everything I learned is helpful to the the world. Sounds like such an arrogant statement, but you know what I mean? To to help, if I help one person, then it's worth it to me. Oh, and, yeah. and I mean, I think with with her plays and everything, you know, that's the whole point is getting the conversation because mm-hmm. in talking about it, that's how you learn. It's like that's why for me, after 30 years, when I, you know, found there were other suicide loss survivors, I, I mean, I really never occurred to me to find other people that had been through this or that there were really other people that had been through this. And then, like, I know for myself, every time I open up the conversation now, because I get to talk about it a lot, because I'm doing a documentary about breaking the silence in my family. And so when I mention that, you know, the conversations go on. And invariably, if there's like more than one person there, someone will say they had an experience with suicide. Totally. I mean, it's just everywhere. And same with depression. Like, everybody's, or everybody, but, you know, so many people have it or have it at different times in their life but don't acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's not like we're talking to people who don't understand what we're going through. Mm -hmm. It's just, we don't know they understand. Well, another piece of it is people don't know what depression is. You know, so many people have texted me or not texted me, have emailed me after an episode going, I didn't know that's what that was, whatever it is. You know, like I believe my mom has a borderline personality disorder. And so many times when I talk about my experience with my mom, I'll get five, six, 10, 15 emails going, oh my God, that was my mom. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm going to read that book you just said you read when you went, oh, my God, all the bells are going off. This lines up entirely with who I experienced my mom to be. And I go, I I didn't even know borderline personality disorder. I didn't know that was a thing. I had never heard that term until I was quite old. I didn't know that the things I experienced could could like someone else had experienced, especially because when people with borderline personalities are pretty formulaic how they behave Mm -hmm. so that formula applies to anybody who has that disorder and it's pretty like universal so it's so helpful to just go well let now i have a place to research that goes against what we were just saying about suicide needing one answer that's not one answer to who my mom was right right Right. well that's that's the diagnosis right that's a a piece of of like when talking about suicide like that that's a, that would be a piece of it right that would right be the de- you know and and so but then there are all these other because there are people who have borderline personality there are people who are depressed or have bi- or bipolar or uh, ang- schizophrenia. anxious schizophrenia like all these all these uh mental health conditions and that's a piece of it but mm-hmm. then there's all these other factors factors that and come pieces. in but it's yeah. hard too because a lot of them like can coexist or, or combine like I never thought I had anxiety because I was never worried about like, oh, you know, are people going to make it home from work or the exactly. going to die? In the... Exactly. But then, you know, when when I finally was in therapy after my breakdown um, and it was explained to me, I'm like, yeah, I like I always feel like there's this hand pushing between my shoulder blades going, go, go, just keep going. Keep... Mm. And my brain's going, what am I supposed to be doing? What am mm. I supposed to be doing? But it's like it's always just this on this hyper vigilance of I don't even know what. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why I tell people, like, it's hard for me because I've lived like this for so long to understand what happiness is. Like the the times I felt like happy, like good things are are happening all around. I kind of just sit there, too. And I'm like, okay, what do I do with this? (laughs) 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 Or or for me, it's it's becoming so familiar with I I feel good, probably because I'm feeding the anxiety when I'm going and I'm not stopping and I'm getting stuff done. and, And I just don't have I don't even have time to eat. And it feels amazing. No, I'm familiar right. with mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. I'm just feeding it because I'm not taking care of myself and I'm actually just kind of letting it push me. Right. Yeah. I think the other thing is when realizing that you're, you have depression or anxiety or you're suicidal or whatever, it doesn't actually solve the problem. No, that's <laughs> yeah. right. It exacerbates it in some ways because well, you keep thinking about it. It could be and it could be the first step in getting yeah. help because right. there's this guy named Halston. Mm hmm. Was in the other room, mm-hmm. and when we did my episode on depression, he didn't realize he had depression. And am I saying this right, Halston? Yep. And then he <laughs> went, "Oh, hold on. Yeah. Oh, that's me. Oh, I do that. Oh, I feel that way. Hold on, I might be depressed." So that's what right. uh, originally I got on a tangent on this borderline personality, but that's what I mean. People don't even right. know that what they're experiencing is something that can get help. Right. Yeah, and like I, that depends. at the show. I, I so what we do is on Saturdays we mm-hmm. do uh, Q and A's after where Ruth joins us and it's me and Ruth and Salim and uh, a couple of the directors or writers. Everyone's gone through safe messaging training, and we have a, a discussion in front of people because the whole show is designed to get people to talk mm-hmm. and and start kind of teasing the conversation out a bit and you know. And I think some of our questions end up being really interesting because you end up it's it is people who are sitting there going, oh, I didn't realize this or I I finally feel I, like I, I'm comfortable to talk about this mm-hmm. and ask mm-hmm. this question. And it, yeah, it, it's just really interesting. And yeah. yeah and the, then I usually have a table with resource material from the AFSP and always like a, always a couple someone. of people that somebody will come and stand there and tell me their story. Wow. And, uh, I think about three times yeah. people have said, I've never told anybody this before. Wow. Yeah. Because it it creates that safe space. Right. Once you say the word suicide and have a conversation, it's a safe space for people to talk about it. That's and they wonderful. want to. And yeah, we, we typically do a reception after to not push anyone out the door. It's going to be different because of COVID this year. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, the, it is. It's it is just always trying to get the conversation going. And, and so like something like this, too, it, it's like you were saying, even just listening to people speak about it and be comfortable talking, I think can, can do so much. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, if it's one person, that's amazing. Yeah. Cause that one person can translate to people in their circles and mm-hmm. it can just keep spiraling out. 
I actually did a guest speaker spot in a support group that my friend runs um, last night. And everybody, I mean, it's, it's half of them were kind of long-term survivors. And, but there were like six people there that lost somebody in the last few months mm. and it's heartbreaking. But one of them actually said like she was, she was um, on her computer with some work friends and somebody was talking about kiteboarding and she lost her brother. And she's like, Oh, my brother used to love kiteboarding, but she stopped herself from saying it because she thought it would make them uncomfortable. Like what we were all talking about. Mm. And, you know, I said, but like, listen to the enthusiasm you just said that with, Mm -hmm. like, you know, how great is that to add to the conversation? And nobody needs to say anything about it. Like if he was alive, he would have said that Mm -hmm. and whatever. So it's like, that's the kind of normalcy I'm talking about where it's Mm -hmm. like, they know they know he killed himself, but it doesn't have to, like, it doesn't have to hammer her every time she says it. It doesn't have to ask for a reaction from people whenever she, it's just part of the conversation because right. they're part of your life. A right. few years ago, I started doing that where I, I just kind of hit a point where like, if you can talk about your dad or your friend or your parent, why can't I talk about mine? So I'm just going to do it. And now maybe I talk about him a little too much because ah. I didn't talk about him <laughs> so freely, but I love telling stories about my dad. And yeah, I used to censor it, but I'm thinking about him all the time. But, but it, it also it, keeps them alive. Cause like, right. Like we live on through the people we leave behind. I think and and our our memories so totally. it, it's and and they were people they did have lives and they, they they did create memories with you like that didn't go away just because of the way they died and that's yeah. the biggest problem with suicide you get stuck on the way they died that's uh-huh. why the grieving's hard and all that you have to get past that but it, people do that's I mean when you remember somebody I I mean I asked my relatives when I started talking to them I'm like can you think of mom without thinking about the suicide and they said no interesting it's it's hard too with the trauma like i mean i'm my home was a crime scene like that's crazy yeah there's crime tape yeah and 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 i would get really stuck on that sometimes like and i still do because that image to me it's so strong and and um and um but but you have to move through that to like get back to or they have to or for me it's learning to coexist with both And and not just staying on those images of that day because that right. day was a lot. And but oh. there's so much trauma that you have to. I've been diagnosed with PTSD from it. Oh, there's, yeah, I'm sure. There's so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when I live over here, or I at least get to bring this other, I'm gesturing with my hands. When I live, when I go <laughs> back to the memories, yeah, and and really get to to remember him, that you know, the 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 better, or not even always better, just more well rounded human yeah. being. Mm-hmm. It, it feels better. Yeah. They're three dimensional. Yeah. They're, they're like, they were part of, cause you know, for not talking about my mom, it's like all I had were the pictures and the photo albums. So she became, those were kind of my memories, whatever mm-hmm. we had a picture of. But then when I started talking to people, you know, like I didn't even remember my dad's pet name for her. until I read her suicide note again and she signed it that way. And I was like, I can't believe I forgot that. Right. Like, that was yeah. so it was just a part of my everyday life. Right. Um, so that kind of stuff, like I said, it, it's sort of making her alive again in my mind, more mm-hmm. of a three dimensional character that did things and wasn't just this memory. Yeah. It's and interesting. One, oh, go ahead. You go. Ahead. Well, just for the kids of, of survive, of, you know, of, of parents who have died too. I, I know, um, I didn't, because it's painful for them, but with fa- certain family members, like who had longer time mm-hmm. with him, like I'm hungry. For, mm-hmm. for stories about my dad mm-hmm. and not everyone wants to talk about my dad. And that's like a really hard thing to respect. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, because also how are you going to pull it out if they don't want to? But I, I would just love nothing more than to just them tell me stories about him for hours. Right. Because things I don't know and, right. and things that I would maybe get from him as, you know, we turn into friends as, right. you know, I was going to get older. And yeah. You do. Uh, yeah. Well, it sounds like a, a theme here is that when someone commits suicide, they're erased. Pretty much. Yeah. That's really a shame. That's a shame. That's really sad. Yeah. You know, we lost uh, one of our groomsmen to suicide and we still talk about him. We have a picture of him with Georgia. <laughs> I just I have it in, in another room when Georgia was little, probably like nine, 10 months old. And he's so happy holding her. He's got the best look on his face. Mm -hmm. He was not good with kids. Uh, He was not into that. You know, Bert and I were moving into the married with children phase. He he never moved into that phase. He was a bachelor all the way until he passed away. But we taught Bert still tells stories about Croy because he's was 
part of our life. We were so mm-hmm. devastated when he w- when he was gone. We just couldn't wrap our head around it. We were mm-hmm. really, really flabbergasted. I mean, we were like completely floored. And of course, Bert immediately was like, I didn't call him enough. I didn't show up enough. I didn't do enough. And it's just not true. Um, you know, luckily I've been in therapy for years and I was able to talk to my therapist about it because it was clearly very upsetting, but she said, you know, tell Bert, if someone decides to do that, there's nothing you could have done. Nothing. We, we talk about that a lot in in the Q and A's and the training. Yeah. Cause also, you know, one of, one of the things you, you tell people to do, especially if somebody's like in crisis is, you know, take them to the emergency room or whatever. But I always make sure to say to people, you know, but even if you do that, you're not responsible for keeping them alive. Right. You're responsible for notice, you know, if you're there with them in crisis for getting them help. Yeah. That's it. That's, yeah, yeah. you know, they, because you can't keep somebody else alive. No. And if they, yeah, that's what she said. And they'll find a way. She was like, if they really want to, they'll find a way. Yeah. She said the same thing. There's nothing you could have done. Sometimes you can put time in between them where they'll, right. they'll you get out of, they'll move out of it. Yeah. But there's some people who just, it's going to happen. Yeah. Right. I think I equated it last time I talked to you about this was like with drug addiction. You know, some people can go to rehab once and they'll get over it. Some people go back three, four times and then they'll be OK. And some people never do. So right. it's the same with suicide. Mm-hmm. Some people you can totally help. You know, some people they may attempt a couple of times, but find a way to live. And then others, they're determined. I mean, my mom, she was at the point where she was determined to die. Like right. she would have found a way one way. It, it, my dad could have watched her for 24 hours and fallen asleep for two seconds. And she probably would have found a way mm. because she was that desperate. She was ready. But, um, you know, like I said, she was ill, and, you know, yeah. there were physical and emotional things going on. But um, yeah, but but the idea is, you know, if you if you do see somebody in crisis, you try to help them, you try to separate them from any kind of lethal means because, you know, that whatever hour you can get, you know, that they didn't do it, maybe something will change in their brain or maybe right. you can get them to someone who can help them. There's always that chance, right. but you can't take it on if they do kill themselves. Right. Like, it's not your fault. No. It, it, it can't be. Yeah. I mean, how could it? No. You can't keep somebody yeah. alive. Yeah. So what have you learned? What do you think is the biggest thing you've learned from your putting the, your, uh, uh, putting a show sounds like we're like, let's put on a show. Oh, it's Oklahoma. Yeah. Yeah, my, but from the, your production. The, yeah. The play year. series. And uh, what's the biggest thing you've learned? I've learned how to ask for help better. Mm. To be honest, it's, that's been a, and, and it really does translate into all areas. But learning how to ask for help and learning and getting to reinforce that there's no timeline. These are big things that are worthy of being talked about. And mm-hmm. there are a lot of people who need to talk about it mm-hmm. and that who need permission to talk about it. Right. Or feel that they do. Right. So uh, is this on YouTube? No. So uh, last year it was, but we're actually back live in person. It'll be in, in Hollywood at the Stella Adler Theater. Mm-hmm. We oh. do two weekend run. Uh, it's vaccinated only and uh, masks and it'll, it'll be two weekends. What we are the dates? Uh, September 10th mm-hmm. through the 19th, mm-hmm. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, mm-hmm. Fridays and Saturdays at eight Sundays at seven. The Saturday shows have the Q and A's with Ruth mm-hmm. and the, the, um, the tickets, $15 and the um, Sunday, the 12th is a pay what you can. For, for people who who that that's a little too steep for. Got it. And she does split the money with um, right. the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Oh, that's so lovely. That's really, really wonderful. Um, I kind of wish you put it on YouTube also. So people in Wisconsin could benefit. Yeah, I, I we did last year. I, I'm looking at a re, but possibly doing a re-release of the readings we did. Mm-hmm. It's complicated because of equity mm-hmm. and SAG. Equity, I see. Equity for those listening is some, the union for stage. She's gotten some big names in there. So yeah, we had uh, on the YouTube last year. We had Stephen Toblowski join mm. us, and that was really a dream for me. That's great. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, I think it's wonderful that you started this. We're lucky in LA that we have it as a resource. I wish uh, surely ac- Actors Equity could make some kind of exception and let you broadcast it for people because it is for people's benefit as much if not more 
than entertainment. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Uh, we do do the show in Dallas as well. And oh, you we're do? talking about, uh, I have a friend from Guadalajara. She wants to bring it there. Wow. So, the, you know, it's, it's not off the table that we'll be able to move it around eventually. Right. But it, it, yeah, it's a lot of, uh, I feel like tape. <laughs> I have to I, figure I, out. I, and, I think it would actually be a great thing. They, they can find the right place for it to take around to schools. I think it would yeah. be a really great oh, well, yeah. teaching Obviously. instrument. That would be great. It, it's all about me needing to find the help and the funding. So it, it's it's what it always is because yeah. I I <laughs> I do a lot. That's, but that's I can't, why we're putting it out there. Colin. I can't do yeah, it. Is, I right? can't do it. I can't do it all by myself. And uh, you know, and we're we're looking at doing short films and those will be able to go around. Right. Yeah. That'd be great. I wish I wish they could be broadcast. That, that I'm bummed. I'm, that makes me angry. I don't like that. Oh, me too. Because um Equity is a a wonderful institution that should be in place, absolutely. But for something like this, it should be just like excused. Oh. You can do whatever you want in this arena because it is such a performance for good. And you know, as as wonderful as unions are, they do make things very complicated. I think sometimes. when people want to volunteer for a good cause, they should be able to, but. It is obviously a very complex issue because yeah. there's a lot of theaters and and yeah. then it, it it yeah stinking unions the stinking unions <laughs> ah but just stay in the car industry I okay go, I watch <laughs> I I go just, four out of the six shows usually uh-huh. to, to for the table and the talkbacks and I love it like every time I see it I get something else out of it that's and great I love hanging around these people because they are just so dedicated yeah. and really care about the subject and it's just it's a real treat to be a part of it. It's inspiring, right? It's inspiring because if you think about it, that isn't that what you're supposed to do with your life? With your life, you're supposed to have service in your life mm-hmm. in some capacity. And if you can take something that you know so well, unfortunately, because you've had to live it and give it back in some form of service, I don't know how else you mm-hmm. could, you know, you'd have to consider yourself a really good person because that's what you're supposed to do with your life is find a place where you can be of service. Um, Good for you for doing that. Thank you. Good for you. Thank you for talking to me about it. Thanks Thanks for having me. I'm so glad to have you. Nice to meet you. Ruth knows the good people. Ruth's like, I have this friend. You're the second friend that she's referred to me. And I'm like, damn, that's a good person. Ruth's great. (laughs) Uh, We did a Zoom together. Her name. Oh, Anne-Marie last year for. um, No. Yeah. Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie. Yeah. For, for, um, because we did a suicide, like a suicide prevention Yes, we did in September. Yeah. This is my annual appearance. (laughs) Right, right. You're annual every September. So (laughs) September is Suicide Awareness Month. Yes. Yes. Ruth, give me some resources. Um, American Foundation for Suicide Pre- Prevention, AFSP.org, um, specifically suicide, um, NAMI, the National Alliance of Mental, Mental Illness, NAMI.org. Um, those are kind of two main, like NAMI is more just mental health and AFSP is suicide specific. So those are great places to start and they can lead you to other other resources. And you lead, like AFSP has books and films and stuff you can see and and they also have a way to find support groups, things like that. So does NAMI. So depending what you're looking for, either of those should should be a first stop to get you there. And the prevention line. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is 1-800-273-8255. And you can use that uh, if you're in crisis or you, or you know someone who's in crisis and you're trying to get guidance. Yeah. And then there's also the text, the crisis text line. And you just text. I think anything start, you can text start to 741741 and you can go back and forth with someone who can also help you. That's great. Yeah. But, but it is important to know that all those resources, if you know someone in crisis, you can call to. It doesn't have to be the person. You, yeah. ha- you don't have to be the one in crisis. Exactly. You just have to, you just have, to have help someone. somebody. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's really good information. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank um, you for the numbers. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
I, well, I had an embarrassing incident recently where I didn't remember the number on a on a YouTube interview. I was about to. And you're like, you're in the head. I was like, this is awkward. It's, I haven't done I think this it's, in a while. It's, it's 1-800-CARS-FOR-KIDS. I mean, no, no. 1-877-CARS-FOR-KIDS. K-A-R-S, cars for kids. No, never mind. That's not it. That's not it. You talk about the song. You don't? No. You don't know eight seven. You haven't lived here long enough then. Uh, <laughs> do you watch TV? Do you listen to the radio? Um, no. Oh. Well, I listen. To K- I listen to KCRW. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much, ladies, for coming. Thank Thanks you. Thank you for us. having us. Best of luck on your on your show. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. 